matter with that cat there? Must be full of reefer. Full of reefer? Yeah, man. You mean that cat's high? Sailing. Sailing. Sailing lightly. We now wander off the beaten path with an update from the Reefer Reporter. Hello and welcome to the Reefer Reporters. News Hawks, Kim Cooper and myself, Al Graham, are your 30-minute audio digest of Canadian international cannabis news. This week is for January the 9th to the 15th, 2018. Well, Kim, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good, Al. Lots of new and exciting stuff going on in the world of cannabis this last week. Seems January is always very busy in news uh, with uh, people doing things for the brand new year, right? Yes, it is. I think it's. I also think it's great that there's constantly news out there about the cannabis issue uh, in the papers and stuff for people to read because there was so long where there was no news available. That's for sure. That's for sure. In today's world, we're seeing headlines, uh, you know, newspapers, radio, uh, uh, television ads, news reports, and even, you know, full-length feature films and stuff being shown on television and and in theaters that are educating the public on cannabis and what's going on with uh, laws in different countries and the whole uh, industry's, you know, uh, uh, transformation that we've has been taking place over the last few years. Oh, it sure has. Sure has. Talking about transformations and changes, uh, the audio that you hear at the beginning of the program here, I'm going to shout, uh, throw a shout out and thanks to uh, Diesel Phillips. Uh, that intro was the uh, intro to a five minute news segment that uh, I did uh, along with uh, Diesel, who did a classic music podcast many years ago. And uh, he did this while he was DJing and producing on a uh, radio station in Belleville. So he's given me permission to keep using it. That's excellent. I'm community coming together. You know, we're all collaborating together to get this stuff out there. And it's great to see the artistic endeavors come together like this as a group. That's right. Well, we've got lots of news to cover, so I think we better get at it. Absolutely, absolutely. Right off the bat, we've got a uh, big newscast was on national news show called the CBC, The National. It airs every week on our CBC television. This week, they had on a uh, podcast, uh, I guess it's a, uh, what do they call these things? Uh, Mini series. Mini series. Thank you so much for that. Lost my words there. Mini series. This one is a, a focusing on you know legalization and where we're going in the medical cannabis world as well as the recreational cannabis world in Canada. As we all know, major transformations taking place. Mini series focused this week around Afria. Uh, which is a uh, LP in Canada, along with one and only our friend of the show, Abby Roach, as well as Clint Young and Alan Gertner, who used to work for Google and has now evolved over into the cannabis uh, industry here in Canada. And they all went on the on the show and they spoke to what they're individually doing uh, within the regime here in Canada and how it's transformed over the last 20 years that Miss Abby has had her shop for almost two decades. Correct. Yeah, it was good. It was good to uh, see them to get uh, their perspective on things. Absolutely. It was great to see the the various uh, people that were there. Uh, They started out with Afria, which is an LP in Canada, and they showed how the transformation came to be that they began uh, to grow cannabis for the medical community and what they plan on doing to uh, expand their operations to encompass the recreational market that's coming later this year in Canada. Went on to speak to Abby and Clint at the Hotbox, and then Alan Gertner uh, in Toronto, who owns the uh, a, a shop on uh, Bloor Street, I believe. Quite an interesting show, and I'm looking forward to part two in the series. Yes, it's uh, it was good. It was good to hear from Abby and Clint to to hear what they had to say. You know, on, like Abby was talking about a lot of stuff about the histories and and things like that about the cannabis issue. So you know, while you're doing these news programs, you're also educating people, which is very good. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and as we mentioned before, Abby, she's just go, go, go. She's in she's in the government's uh, sites all the time. Yep, yep. And yep. she seems to pop it up in our newscasts on a regular basis. She does, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I know I posted, uh, I took some actual, some pictures during the, the uh, broadcast, and I posted them on my Facebook page. 
Yeah, yeah. I had it out I had the Lung Cup as well on social media. Uh, it's a must-see miniseries. If you haven't seen it as of yet, uh, go to the check out the uh, social media pages or look up CBC The National and give it a look. Like, give it a look. Yeah, it's, a, it's there. Very- Legalizing recreational marijuana in Canada. That's the headline. Yeah. What's next? What's next? All right. We are going to fly on out to Manitoba because... The headline out there says that Manitoba communities are speaking out about not wanting retail pot sales in the communities. Yeah, so far out of 130 municipalities, 97 are in favor of retail shops. 18 have said no, they don't no. want uh, outright no's, 18 communities. 22 are kind of undecided, they're, they're on the fence on whether or not yeah. they want this situation is popping up in other provinces as well that we've seen. Uh, Ontario, Richmond Hill uh, doesn't want them there. I think Thornhill, the same thing in Ontario. Uh, Richmond some of Hill. The, uh, yeah, and, and some of the uh, native communities are speaking out and saying, yeah. nope, we're dry reserves. We don't want them here. Um, it, it's an issue for for the people that are in that community that do want to partake. I mean, everybody's rights, uh, if you go yes, then somebody's rights are trampled on that don't want it. If you say no, then the rights of the person that does want it are trampled on. Tough situation for municipalities, eh? Yes, it sure is. And, you know, it's, you know, the government can always, the federal government always turn around and say, well, people can order online and have it delivered to them. But that's not, you know, that's not the experience people are looking for. And, and I'm not talking about the guy who wants to go in and open up a jar and smell and touch the stuff. I'm just talking about the person who all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden they get some friends that are coming over. They're going to do some entertaining. And, uh, you know, instead of running down to the liquor store to grab a, a small bottle to share a few drinks with, be, you know, uh, they won't be able to go grab uh, a few grams of cannabis at their local store on something that is spontaneous. And yeah. I think just that so many people just feel or just think that no matter where you live in Canada, you're going to be able to buy it. But that's not always the case. That's for sure. That's for sure. You know, bylaws can override um, federal, provincial policy. Uh, and that's it's some. It's it's. A, it's a sticky situation. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can understand it a little bit, but at the same time, if it's legal federally, provincially, um, do municipalities really have that right to trample on the rights that were given to us by our country or by our province? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's going to have to be contested in the courts. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. once again, back to court we go, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We're well, the court's been very favorable to us over the years, that's for sure. Yeah, so. that's for sure. Yeah. All yeah, right. Sure. Where are we off to now? Ah, Sudbury, Ontario. Of course I have to get a northern community story in on this newscast. Sudbury, Ontario, located in the north, of course. Their chief of police uh, has made the news recently on the CBC, uh, and he's one of the newest cops to speak out and say, hey, you know what? I'm concerned about legalization. I'm concerned about the training of my officers and how they're going to deal with this this new herb being legal. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Police Chief of Sudbury, but get your head out of the sand. People have been consuming this plant for centuries. It isn't a new drug on the market. It isn't a new herb just being released that people are going to start consuming all of a sudden. Um, Legalization should bring forth less policing. You should need less training. Uh, I mean, you're no longer breaking down doors and looking to arrest people for possessing this plant. So what training do you need to roll laws back? I just cannot wrap my head around this. How about you, Al? And as far as not knowing what's going to happen or what's coming down the pipe, the legislation is already before the Senate. Yes, it's not finalized, but they already have a good idea on on how it's going to look or how it's going to be formed. They already know there's going to be, when it comes to policing in the roads and stuff like that, when it comes to driving, they already know there's going to be some type of legislation involved in all that. So it's not as if they're completely blind here. That's right. That's right. And impaired driving is impaired driving. I will speak on this. People that are new to using cannabis 
should not operate any motorized vehicle while consuming cannabis. That's just plain silly. You wouldn't take, you know, uh, prescription medicine that makes you uh, stoned in the head where you're not able to function properly and drive a vehicle. You won't do it when you're drinking. Don't do it when you're stoned. It's the same thing for sure. As far as policing goes, you can screen. We have screening for impairment. No matter what you're impaired on, if you're impaired, that's going to show up in the routine screening that they do now. Uh, no extra training should be needed, really. Yeah, well, there's, uh, you know, some people say, well, you, well you're, maybe you're stoned, you might be able to still pass those tests. Well, any test that's out there as far as these, sativa, these uh, saliva tests, it's more about proving consumption than impairment. Absolutely. The chemical-based tests, the saliva tests, the blood tests, all of those things, all they do is prove consumption. Uh, you know, roadside testing consists m the more than the actual saliva test and the breathalyzers. There's more to it than that. There are, are, are officers are trained to know, you know, do the different routine, you know, put your nose, finger on your nose, you know, stand on one foot, this and that. Other than people that have a disability that would prevent them from doing that. If you are a normal, able-bodied person, failing these sort of simple tasks proves impairment. And to me, that's the only judgment that should be used as far as cannabis or impairment goes. Because the other ones, all they do is prove consumption. As you said, they do not prove impairment. Yeah, and you would think that something would have come up by now. It's been legal in Colorado for how long? You know, they have laws down there as well, but yet there's been nothing from their federal government or state government showing anything legit as far as the amount of uh, THC in a person's system to show that um, they are impaired. So. Absolutely. You know, regular patients that are patients, we have a high tolerance, so we'll have these higher quantities in our system on a regular basis. Yeah. That does not say that we're impaired. We've become immune to the meds, and that's what happens over a course of time. So this, of course, is for patients and long-term users. But anybody that is new to cannabis, and if you feel impaired, simply don't get behind the wheel. Don't give these people cause to say, see, I told you. Yeah. Keep it away from there. Yep. Exactly, because uh, we don't want to see anybody get hurt, that's for sure. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So what's up next? Uh, now up we're leaving next. Sudbury and we're going to... We are going to go to, let's see, we are off to school. We're off to school. Yes, we're off to school. We've only got a couple minutes here, so let's go to, we've got this story here on this girl in Illinois. She's an 11-year-old girl who's suffering from leukemia, and she wants to be able to go to her school. And, and the authorities won't allow her to go because it's medical marijuana going to a school, and they don't like that. But a judge has overruled them, and she is allowed to attend. And it's fantastic news. Um, you know, finally, we're getting some legitimacy as a medicine. You know, the school is on a prescribed medicine. They would not restrict any other medicine in a school, so there's no reason to restrict cannabis medicine use. Uh, big win for, for patients everywhere. Awesome news coming out of Illinois. Yes, for sure. And the, uh, they, they've been giving them their daughter this stuff legally uh, for years. Uh, not for years, but legally. Uh, and it's um, she's been using a medical marijuana foot patching and rubbing oil with positive results. And, you know, they wouldn't allow this girl to go to school because she's using a, a foot patch or, or yeah. oil on her you skin. Know, a patch and a cream. You can't go to school if you're using that patch and the cream. I mean, she's not standing there, you know, 11 years old, wailing on a joint. You know, this isn't the case. So seeing the acceptance happen at this, even if it's forced, uh, you know, forced acceptance is acceptance. And it will, you know, hopefully plant a seed and grow roots and, and flourish throughout the, the, yeah. the uh, state there. As her, as her mother says, fix the law. It's always been it's caught up in reality. It's, it's behind the times. All right, Kim, on to the next story. You're up. What do you got for us? Now we're going to take the bus all the way over to Saskatchewan. 
Saskatchewan, the lovely flatlands of Saskatchewan. Minister of Agriculture there would like to see an opportunity to farmers for farmers to grow marijuana as a cash crop to help the prairies in their uh, ailing uh, farmlands that are happening there right now. He thinks it'll be a huge boost boom to the crop, to the uh, industry, uh, as well as for helpful to farmers. In his so province. He wants this the stuff to grow out in the field like corn? Yep. Uh, that's his plan. He said, you know, he knows that this isn't going to happen overnight or probably any time in the near future. But it's his vision for the future of farming in Saskatchewan to see the prairie provinces grow cannabis much as they do corn or other uh, wheat products out there and uh, replace a lot of it because of the ailing industry and the uh, issues with growing. Cannabis is easy to grow. Hemp is even easier to grow. And he would like to see this pro- the province of Saskatchewan green with cannabis. That would be really awesome, you know. But I think about, I think back to my younger days and knowing about people who are going into farmer's fields and coming out with a a bushel basket full of corn on the cob for dinner that night. Would they have any concerns about people coming out with a big baggie of buds for the evening? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Well, to quote quote this minister, he says, I don't know if we'll ever get to a point where we will see it grown in open fields like this. But if there is, if there is, of course, there will be fencing and security requirements. But we're not quite there yet. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> so the story is coming to you from CKRM, the source online, uh, Mr. Jim Smalley reporting through 620 CKRM in Regina. All right. I want to move on to another story, another story of dealing with a patient. And that has to do with a, a young girl in Toronto with rare, rare seizures disorders who, thanks to medical marijuana, is making a a great comeback. Yeah, fantastic story. Uh, Little Miss Alva Calandra, who's only nine, was born two weeks late, weighed less than five pounds, uh, and she, her parents soon noticed her struggling with breathing. Uh, It's been a trial and error for these these parents with this little girl uh, for many, many years, and they could credit uh, cannabis to saving her life. Yeah, exactly. So it, say that she's diagnosed with, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, with wolf horn syndrome. It's a rare genetic disorder where patients are missing part of their fourth chromosome. Yeah. As a result Very... of her condition, she's nonverbal, eats through a feeding tube, and has severe seizures. Yeah. And and we've seen this many times, you know, with our friend Mandy McKnight and her son Liam. Uh, they also find, you know, such wonderful relief for Dravet syndrome and that they that he suffers from with cannabis. Cannabis has been known to fight seizures. You know, first study was done in the 1940s and then mm-hmm. hidden, you know, from us. So I mean, uh, we know this medicine reacts well with seizures and especially in children. Yeah, her family says her quality of life has improved immensely. Um, they say that uh, she can sleep through the night without seizures. Seizures. She's been able to attend school five times a week and rides a specialized bike and is trying to learn how to walk. Fantastic. <laughs> Talking about Fan- improving quality of life. Yeah, I mean, nine years old, she's finally learning how to walk. I mean, this is a whole new world for this child that has, you know, lived inside of a shelf for so long. Yeah. And it's encouraging that the family is now helping to, hoping to offer other families with similar circumstances, you know, like like Ava's help and, and uh, you know, for uh, education and uh, passing on the information on, on the relief that they found with this plant. Yeah, they started a charity called Angels Like Ava. And uh, they're for ch- to help children, families uh, with this rare genetic disorder. So Excellent. They're, awesome. they're spreading the word and uh, helping others as well. Awesome. Just a fantastic initiative with, with Ava. And I wish her the best of our, our prayers are with you, with the family, for sure. For sure. For sure. Uh, all right. What do we got next? Well, we're going to run south a bit here and head on and down back into the states a little bit and talk about Washington. Washington has a bill prohibiting cities from banning 
marijuana cooperatives. Now, this is, is something that Canada has also been looking at. Many in Canada are interested in, so it caught my eye. Uh, cooperative or grow co-ops are very popular amongst growers. Um, you know, you get a group of 10 patients that come together and they would like to grow together. You know, purchase a plot of land, everybody plants their crops for their medicinal needs and grow them together in a co-op. It saves people time, it saves people money, and it shares the information uh, that's out there. It's a great idea to save patients money and smoke, uh, you know, the kind of and consume the kind of uh, medication that you want to consume uh, uh, under natural growing conditions. So it's encouraging to see Washington allowing this bill to go through. They're banning any any uh, municipalities that wish to stop these people from doing this, and that's great. Yes, for sure. Oh, there's a name I recognize, Steve Cub- Steve oh, it could be Kirby. Oh, okay, different name. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's that's great that they're going to stop um, communities from uh, outlawing that because you look back to our, our first story where um, their communities are are making it so that um, they can't uh, buy cannabis within it, you know, outlawing yeah. the stores. So out, out, and that's what we're facing here in Canada, you know, yeah. communities outlawing stores. So once we have community grow ups popping up, that'll be on the hit list next. So it's encouraging to see that there is a precedence being set in Washington. Yes, exactly. All right. Let's see. We are going to move on to our next story, which is 21 substances more dangerous than cannabis that are totally legal. This was done by Greenflower Media with Anna Wilcox. And it's 21 things. Now, we're not going to touch on all 21. I don't think we got enough time for that, but we'll go through them. A few. Yeah, of them. for sure. A couple of number one on the hit list, sugar. Sugar. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. I Let's mean, that's, that's the big one for all of us, right? We're all got that sugar in our diets, you know. Uh, some of the other ones on the list are medications, anti-inflammatories and such. Yeah, right? common things like caffeine yeah energy Energy. drinks yeah fast food of course you know trans fats uh lots of stuff on here yeah antibiotics Uh, there's another medication uh artificial sweeteners yeah yeah there's something everybody cooks with usually on the frying pan teflon Yes, Teflon. We've all got Teflon frying pans. And, of course, two of the of the top ones in here as well that we all know and, and some of us love. Tobacco and alcohol have also made the list, you know, as, as more harmful than cannabis. Yeah, yeah. Even fragrances. I guess you could say, like, the sprays, you know, the uh, colognes and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them, you know, you breathe them in and, you know, it damages lungs, right, if they're freshly sprayed. So lots of things to think about out there, about how much more on this planet is is so much more harmful to you than cannabis. And yet we have such ridiculous laws and regulations around this innocent plant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because some of these these are additives into food and the whole bit, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, sure. take a look for that. Uh, green uh, Green Flower Media is yeah. uh, where that's from. Okay, well, uh, next on the list, I think we're probably going to travel around the world. Yeah, we're going to go halfway around the world. We're all the way over to Uzbekistan. Uh, this is an industrial hemp story. Uzbekistan is in grow industrial hemp as a way to clean up um, you know, contaminated uh, lands. Uh, this is a story that comes to us out of Trend News Agency online. Uh, they plan to grow some industrial hemp uh, uh, to clean up the, kind of some powerful uh, antiseptic property that was uh, that was uh, used uh, contaminated over construction. So they're using it to clean the soil. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we've seen this uh, story uh, happen before. You know, there's been calls for it to be grown in places like Chernobyl and uh, Japan and and other places that have had radioactive leaks and that sort of thing. So it's encouraging to see Uzbekistan is jumping on the hemp bandwagon, bandwagon. to uh, to help reclaim some land. 
Okay, yeah, well, they're looking at getting that started this year into next year, which is uh, which is great. It's good to see. Absolutely. Good to, good to see. Okay, let's see. Now, moving on to our last story. And I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to maybe go through this one as quickly or, or as thorough as some of the other stories, but I think the whole idea behind this is pretty is pre- is pretty well accepted by many people, and that is the the fellows or the ladies and gentlemen out there in Canada <clears throat> during this legalization that have criminal records, and about the uh, giving automatic to pardons to people who presently have a a record for simple possession. You know, a person who got busted for five joints. I've got I've got a friend who got busted twice for three joints, and yeah. why should he? You know, he shouldn't have a criminal record. And in this legalization coming forward, I would hope that the government is going to do something about that as soon as it's legalized. Absolutely. Uh, This is an issue that must be addressed sooner rather than later. Uh, People's lives are destroyed. You know, we know of people in the community that have lost children uh, where CAS has been involved because of of these ridiculous charges, you know, for possession. Simple possession, anybody that is convicted of it should be pardoned. Uh, And and I don't see a whole lot of movement on this front coming out of the government's office. you know, uh, coffers right these days. Yeah, I know the government has mentioned that they're going to do it once it's legalized. I don't think it was as if they thought that they were putting the cart before the horse. I guess maybe yeah. on that aspect of things. But it's good to see that they are talking about it, which gives a better indication that it's you know a possibility versus you know not even entertaining it. Yeah, I, I'm glad they're talking about it, but my goodness, they better yeah. not take too long to discuss this because it's well, a pretty simple matter, in, in my opinion. Yeah, same here. And then there's the thing where the former government under Stephen Harper increased uh, pardon fees, uh, like almost doubled them, I understand. Uh, you know, would would these people be required to pay a pardon fee or would this be something that would just be done through legislation and yeah. criminal records would be removed. And then, you know, are they still going to remain on CPAC? Or CPAC is, you know, is the U.S. government going to be able to have access to this? Well, that's and Shared just information, it, you know. right? Yeah, that's just it. And, it. and I think it all comes down to how they do it. You know, I know if you're granted by a, a court, if you're granted an absolute discharge, then that is supposedly wiped from your record and CPAC does not have access to that. So they would have to do something along those lines in order to wipe it away completely. I don't know whether or not that's possible after the fact of a conviction or not through legislation. As far as pardons go, pay a fee for a pardon is different than having a sentence rolled back by the courts or by legislation. A pardon is that it, it's still on your record, but it's been so long that you've been good, we're going to say you're a new guy and it doesn't affect your life yeah. anymore. So it's kind of a different thing for a pardon. Okay, well, that's our report, our reef report for January the 9th to the 15th, 2018. And in closing, weed like to remind you to tune in to the Pace Radio Show every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. on LifestyleRadio.net. Plus, a big thank you to you for listening to our Reefer Report podcast. If you enjoyed it, please share it like you would a tray of infused treats and as a way to help educate others. Thank you. Respect right. makes the world go round. Respect uh-huh. don't put others down. Respect. A necessity. R E S P E C T. Respect. Come again. And you can't be fooled. Respect. It's the golden.